Hi everyone. Uh, today I'm going to answer a question that's been asked a lot, um, especially over the last like year or two. Um, those who have been following my family and I on our journey uh, know that Jamie and I separated two years ago. It's been two years ago this fall. And in fact, it was last week. Um, makes two years that we were separated. Um, we've been divorced for about a year. Um, and a lot of people have asked about, you know, what my faith is, um, whether I'm still a, a member of the Mormon church. And today I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, as I do this, uh, I, I immediately think of all of the amazing friends that, and family that I have um, that are in the church. Um, and just the love and respect that I have for all of you. Um, today, I am going to talk about some sensitive stuff. So I just wanna give you a heads up on that. And um, when I look at my, my journey, you know, I was, I was a Mormon until about my 40th birthday. And when I look at my journey in Mormonism, having been born in the church, um, I, there's definitely a, a lot of things <laughs> um, that I can share, but there's a few things that I wanna open up um, today. Uh, uh, with you guys as, as we do this. Uh, I've been gearing up to do this video for quite some time. I've looked at different ways of doing it. I've decided probably the best way for me to do this is just to sit down in a live video and just open up with you and, and share some experiences. So as I do that, um, I want to talk about one of my favorite movies of all time, The Truman Show. Um, the Truman Show has been out since I think like early 90s, so most of you have probably seen it. Um, there may be some spoiler alerts, but, but it's worth it, I think, in this context. Uh, in this story, uh, The Truman Show, the star of the show is Truman, and it was played by Jim Carrey. And Truman is born in this big, huge dome. It's a really big bubble. And um, the thing that's unique about it is Truman does not know that he was born in a bubble, nor does he know he's, he's a star of a reality, a reality TV show. He doesn't know he's on a show and that hidden cameras are all over the place documenting his life. Um, and, he, and again, he was born there and he was born into a world where boundaries were set. They're boundaries that you know he didn't set and, and a world where uh, in general, it was set up to give Truman a safe place to grow up. So as Truman grows up, um, the producers of the show, although they're technically keeping him in this dome and not giving him, you know, all the information, like he has no idea he's, he's in a TV show, they insist that the reason they're doing this is to create a safe, loving, sheltered environment for Truman, which, which sounds wonderful. And as the show grows, um, as, as, as Truman grows up, the show just gets bigger and bigger. And it actually makes a wealth of, of money for the, the people, the creators of the show. Um, the main uh, issue that the creators run into is Truman. Truman, they, it's almost like they cast the wrong kid. Truman was someone that like, since he was a little boy, wanted to explore the entire world, wanted to embrace the world, wanted to, to, to find new places and just experience life. And so that was obviously problematic because if Truman ever found out he was in a dome or left Sea Haven, which was the, the quaint picturesque town that he was raised in, he would surely know that like he he had been deceived that the world was was bigger and different than than what he was you know what he was taught it to be um, when I look at this, I look at ways that they kept Truman in the bubble because again it was problematic he wanted to be an explorer so if you watch the movie there's there's scenes where Truman's like I want to explore the whole world he's this little kid saying i want I want to just see the whole world and just um, get out there and and uh, taste it all. And his teacher in the classroom goes, oh, it's too late. Everything's been explored. Um, yeah, you, we don't need explorers anymore. And um, you'll see that the information that was given to Truman was very, very controlled. He only had certain information. And a lot of it was, was fear tactics. Um, during the movie, you'll see like signs that show an airplane being struck by lightning. Um, that's in a travel agency. <laughs> um, things that he hears on the radio. Uh, they're always saying that the outside world is dangerous, there's problems out there, you could be hurt. Right here, right here's where you wanna be. And right here's where you can be safe, you can thrive, you can be yourself. But yet Truman, as he grows, and as they try to find ways to make him afraid to stay in the bubble, um, he still never really feels like he's himself. In fact, the, the interesting thing about it is the premise is Truman's the only one that doesn't know it's a TV show. So everyone else around him, all these smiling people, 
um, are just presenting that this is your reality. And one of the through lines of the whole movie is the, the guy that's over the whole thing, controlling the dome, says that people will just accept the world with which they're presented. So Truman, over the years, starts to do that. But the interesting thing about Truman is he actually becomes the most disingenuine person in the whole show. You can see that he's someone who's, who's smiling, but yet because he couldn't embrace his own identity and had to kind of take what was kind of, you know, pushed on him, he became this happy person with underlining depression. Um, there's a scene where he walks out and, and he waves to his neighbors and it's just like the same thing every day, very predictable. And he says, you know, good morning. And in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. He almost just becomes this um, puppet of a person. And I love the way that, that they interpreted that and the way that Jim Carrey performs Truman. Um, however, as Truman got older, um, he gets to the age of, maybe, uh, he looks like he's about 12-ish. They're realizing that there's no way they can keep this person here in this dome. He's going to find a way out because it's just kind of who he is. And so they looked at, you know, we've done different fear tactics, but they came up with a way that would ultimately make Truman feel like he was truly trapped. And what they did is they had Truman out on a boat on the water um, with his dad. This is Truman's happiest space. He, he's pretending he's, he's sailing the world while he's out on this boat, this little sailboat with his dad. And then the weather starts to change a little bit and Truman begins to beg his dad to stay out a little longer. Just five more minutes, 10 more minutes. And his dad goes, you know, we really should go back, but if you wanna stay out, Truman, we will. And then this huge storm comes and just wipes them out. Um, Truman's dad falls overboard, but he falls overboard on cue. Um, he falls overboard and what you don't know is scuba divers take him away, but Truman thinks that his dad drowned at sea. At this point, Truman really becomes paralyzed because not only does he have a, a now renewed and deepened phobia of water, which you'd have to go over water um, at some point to get out of Sea Haven, but he also had paralyzing shame because Truman believed it was his fault that his dad died. Um, today, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about what it was like growing up Mormon. It was a beautiful life. Um, I was raised by amazing, loving parents. And to this day, they're a, they're a source of support and love to me. Um, they're people that are very family oriented, as was my community. I was raised in a community where people looked out for each other. People loved each other. Um, people seemed to care and, and just be there. I mean, I was, I was raised Mormon. There was so many beautiful parts about being raised in the community I was. And actually, as I look at my whole life, I wouldn't change it. I'm grateful for all of it. Um, by the time I was 12, you become a young man. Uh, they call 12, 12 and up young men and young women in the church. I was turning 12. And when you turn 12, you get the priesthood. So you get to participate in passing the sacrament as you grow. There's other things you can do within the church and you have kind of priesthood duties. And it's a pretty big milestone. Also, you get to leave primary, and by that point, you're kind of done singing the little songs and stuff like that. You're excited to get out there with the young men, go camping, do all those, those wonderful, fun things. And I remember I was, I was 12, and the bishop had a special meeting. The bishop's the leader of the congregation, and it was a fireside, which is an additional like hour to two hours of church that you do in the evening. And I remember this fireside was, was, was coming. I, I usually wasn't too excited about having another hour of church on a Sunday after already spending three hours of church that afternoon. However, um, it was cool because the older boys were gonna be there, so it made you feel kind of cool. You know, they had the 16 year olds there, the priests. Um, that was really cool. And also, um, as always, they were going to have refreshments for us. They promised brownies. So that was enough, and all my, all my buddies would be there. So I remember going to this meeting and just feeling so excited. I could already smell the refreshments waiting for me. And um, the bishop got up to teach us about uh, just a lesson. And what he taught us about was, was sexual sin. So he told us about you know, fornication, um, different degrees of petting, and, and he talked to us about, about masturbation. And I remember when he talked about it, um, he explained that you know, to touch yourself in any way is a sexual sin. And he went on to quote the church's Strength for Youth pamphlet, um, which, which taught some pretty key 
Mormon doctrine. You can repent if you've had sins. In fact, you can take it to God. Um, you can take it to the person you offended. And that process is, is how you can you know, feel clean and, and whole again. Um, however, if you ever committed a sexual sin, the only way that you can be forgiven is to talk to a Mormon bishop. That's nothing you can work out on your own. And when he explained about touching yourself or stimulating yourself in any way, I just remember getting the biggest pit in my stomach. Just the most, I, I think all the blood drained out of my face. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've, I've done that before. And at the end of the meeting, he kind of wrapped it up and just reiterated, hey, I love you. If you've ever done this though, you do have to talk to me because that's the only way you can, you can be forgiven. And so in that context, I'm sitting there thinking, the only way I can ever be with my family again is I'm gonna have to go talk to the bishop because I, I had done that before and I didn't even know what it was, nor did I realize it was, it was such a grievous sin. Um, it was a sin that they said was, was you know, right up there with, with the biggest sins. And so um, I just remember like at the point when the meeting ended, um, I didn't really say anything to my friends. I was no longer excited for the refreshments waiting for me. I just walked out of the room. And I remember just feeling like, oh my gosh, like this is, this is so awful that I did something this bad. And, and, and so embarrassing that I, that I have to talk to someone about this, that I've got to go talk to this bishop. And um, I sat with it, but I realized, you know what, I, I believed it. By the time I was 12, I was, you know, raised in it. I believed it was true. You know, my, my community was Mormon. My friends were Mormon. Um, and within a week, I found myself in a bishop's office. And when I sat down with the bishop, I, you know, I explained to, to him you know, that, that I'd done that before. And he first said, you know, I, I'm really proud of you. I'm proud of you that, you that you brought this to me. And I'm gonna help you with your repentance, repentance process so that you can feel forgiveness and be forgiven of, of the Lord, of the Savior. Um, we were taught that bishops are common judges in Israel and that when they sit in these interviews, these worthiness interviews, that they represent Jesus Christ. So it's the same as sitting down with Jesus Christ. And so um, he said, look, for the next two weeks, we're not gonna have you take the sacrament. And the reason we're doing that is you really need to feel godly sorrow for, for the sin. And when you feel that godly sorrow, that's gonna help, help you with, with your repentance process. And um, talking a little bit about that, that, sun, that Sunday, um, I, I was, it, like second row in the congregation. And I was on the end of my family. I had a big family. Um, there was like with my parents, there was probably 10 of us there. Um, and uh, I was sitting there and at this point, I'm supposed to get up and pass the sacrament. I was told also that I couldn't participate in passing the sacrament, which was my duty as a, a 12 year old deacon in the church. And before the meeting started, one of my really good friends came up and said, Skylar, hey, we need you to help pass the sacrament. And I was like, you know what? I don't feel very good. I'll, I'll make sure I do it next week. And he goes, no, you don't get it. We're shorthanded, we need you. And he grabbed me and lifted me up on my feet to start pulling me up to the sacrament table. And I just quickly said, you know what? I, I feel like I'm gonna throw up, I can't do it, and sat back down. Um, the sacrament was, was blessed and then um, they began to pass it to the congregation and like to like my dismay, my very good buddy, <laughs> um, my very good friend came up and he's the one who handed me the tray. And I just remember being so embarrassed um, as I took the tray and then handed it to my mom. And then it just moved down the line. But I know they saw me. And uh, you know, based on everything we believed, you, if you don't take the sacrament, it's for one reason. You're not worthy to take it. Um, this was, uh, I mean, if, if, if God wanted me to feel sorrow for any deed I'd ever done and feel bad about myself, this certainly worked. I mean, I, I never quite felt that degree of just shame, of just, just toxic shame. And uh, the very next week um, before the sacrament, we got closer to it, I just pretended I had to go to the bathroom and spent most of that meeting just hiding in the bathroom. So I, I wouldn't have to endure like that, that public um, situation again. Um, I wish that the shaming part was, was the worst of my experience. Um, sadly, it wasn't. 
Um, in fact, there was things that were, that were much worse. Um, when I met the bishop, he also gave me a book. Um, I have a copy of it, and it, it's called The Miracle of Forgiveness. Um, this was written by Spencer W. Kimball, um, who was a prophet, um, I think for over a decade, um, for the church. And the prophet is the president of the church, prophets here in Revelator. And the doctrine is, and it has been from the beginning, that any time a prophet's teaching, um, that it, it, whether it's, it's him saying it or Jesus Christ, there is no difference. Whether by my own voice or the voice of my servant, it is the same. That's like Mormon scripture. And so this book was, was when, when it was given to me, I consider it to be scripture. I mean, it, it was real. And the bishop said, you know, as, as part of your repentance, I'm going to have you read a couple chapters. I'm not going to read from this. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the content. I don't want to get too into it. But um, the book, the chapters that I was supposed to read was, was the sin next to murder, which talked about sexual sins and a crime against nature. And as I read the sin next to murder, it explained that sexual sins are so grievous. Um, he even says it's akin. It's akin to murder. It's right next to it in its survey. survey severity. And that's why the only way I could be forgiven was to actually go and, and tell him, you know, this was the only way for me to be with my family. And so as I read that, um, I started to read more and it, it, it said things like, you know, that it's so close to murder, you've got to really watch yourself and that, that Satan will not get someone to murder someone overnight, um, but he will try to get them with their girlfriend in the back seat of the car. That's actually one sentence. He says that. He puts murder right here and goes, you know, he's not going to get you to murder right away. But, but, you know, just know if, if you mess up with your girlfriend, you are, you're right there. You're dancing with it. So obviously that was something that scared the hell out of me. I mean, it just it, it scared me. I thought, oh, my gosh, before this, I was just a normal, happy kid going through normal human development. But all of a sudden I was like, uh, uh, it just shot the, the wind out of me. Um, I remember during this two week period being at school and I had a hard time focusing. I had a hard time sleeping. I remember being out with my friends at lunch and we'd start getting excited and happy. But when I'd feel that all of a sudden I would remember, um, remember like that, that I'd committed a sexual sin and I would just groan. My heart would just groan. Um, the book also said that, you know, that, that touching yourself, masturbation leads to the crime against nature. It leads to homosexuality, which is the, the darkest of all sexual sins, um, according to Mormonism. And, and that also, if you continue in, 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 with masturbation, it also can lead to bestiality. Um, when I read that, I all of a sudden just, I started thinking, oh my gosh, like, I had no idea that I was this close to become such an evil person. Um, during that period, again, um, it, it was a really challenging time. But by the time I came back in after the two-week period over, the bishop said, hey, you know, the, the Savior forgives you. Um, you're, you have such an important calling in this work. You know, you, you're, you're, you're born into this, this for a reason. And, and being Mormon, um, you know, Mormons, they, they have a lot of doctrine and, and um, they provide like a lot of, uh, you know, commandments and stuff that, that are hopefully to keep you close to God. But they also provide you, um, maybe more than most churches, a, a sense of identity. Because if you were born Mormon, you were, it's the most noble of all birthrights. And God doesn't play favorites. You earned it before you came here. So I was growing up, I was taught, I remember being four and taught that, you know, there was a war in heaven. And in that war, you threw out Satan. You were one of the most noble. You fought with Jesus and, and you fought with Adam. But because of that, just know you got to be really careful because the adversary remembers who you are. Satan knows who you are and he's still mad at you. So he'll do everything he can to destroy you. Meaning you're going you're gonna to fall in some way and you'll never, you'll never be with your family again. I remember even as a young kid, and I can appreciate the fact, I, I do have OCD, but I remember hearing that, that story, and rather than feeling important, it scared me to death. I remember just thinking, oh my gosh, like, like this, this, this devil is going to be after me my whole life. Um, with the process of sitting down with the bishop and opening up about this, I walked out of that office and I never fully trusted or fully loved myself again. Not until I was 40 years old and, and had experiences that helped me 
to maybe just ask a few questions and open up and to, to find my way out of it. Um, and again, I look at this and, and all in all, I, the reason it had such a profound impact on me is I believed it. I really believed it. And there, there will be members of the church that go, oh, it never affected me that way. But I believed what I read. And, and this book convinced me that I was a monster that only the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints could save. Um, this is something that I share. I, again, I don't want to make anyone feel bad. I don't want to even destroy the good that's out there in Mormonism. If you know Mormons, are some of the most amazing people in the world. Um, but I look at this, and just the one thing I want to be clear is there are other young people that, that are going into these worthiness interviews. And when we go back to Truman, there, there was a lot of fear that kept Truman in, but one of the most profound ways that you can enslave someone is one, give them their identity. Anyone giving you your identity and telling you exactly who you are, I would shy away from that. Anyone saying that they have authority, that they have a special connection with the divine that's a little, a little more special or a little more amped up than yours, but they're gonna share with you that, I mean, if I've learned anything, I've learned that God's right here and that worthiness is right here and love and worthiness and being worthy of God's love is not anything that I have to learn. I've learned that family, I mean, the, the whole message is family can be together forever. Family is forever. I believe the connections we have could, could never be broken. So as, as we look at Truman, it was that toxic fear and shame that, that kept him in. And it's something that, that I carried you know, through my whole life. And I look at it, I was 12. I was going through puberty. Um, my, my, my brain was still developing. And, and I just, if you are a member of the church, I love you. If you're one of my friends and you, you're still watching, thank you. <laughs> Maybe send me a text because I, I want to keep in contact in every way and, and keep that, that friendship. But if you are LDS, it's something to consider. I know a really devout mom who's very devout Mormon, very de devout LDS. And she just went to the bishop and said, listen, um, you will never talk to my kids about sex or anything, ever. Um, you can also be with your kids in interviews. That's something I encourage. Um, but recently, the, the church in recent years has put out surveys saying that they, they, they're interested in starting these worthiness interviews, regular ones, at the age of eight rather than the age of 12. I just want to respond to the church on this matter. No more. No more worthiness interviews. God's children are worthy without you. And I am worthy without you. And, and uh, you know, like I said, my, my life was beautiful. I don't feel like a victim to anything. In a lot of ways, Mormonism was like a cocoon. And it was something that, a, a place where I grew, but I did find my way out of it. And coming out of it has not been easy. It's like, it's like all of a sudden there's all this, I'm a beautiful butterfly. <laughs> and there's all this light and all this possibility and, and, and love in the world is so much bigger than I ever thought it was but you still feel like your wings are kind of wet and you still feel disoriented. Um, I was in a show, one of my favorite people of all time is my high school theater director, Russ Saxton. And he had us, we were in the Dyer Van Frank and he said, you know, I hope this is something that you grow from, but even something that changes who you are and, and something you learn by being in this play. So I played Peter Van Dan in the Dyer Van Frank. And at the end of it, one of the things that, that, that Anne writes in her journal, and here she's been in an attic for years, starving to death, missing the sunshine, missing all these things. But Anne wrote down, I still believe people are good at heart. And that's one of the most powerful statements that, that I've ever heard. But I've found just like Truman, when he gets out of the bubble, yeah, sure there was people that may take advantage of you and sure there's risks or you may be manipulated, but that was already happening, happening to him. Finding my way out, I have just a greater love, a profound love for everyone. And this world that I was taught to fear, I believe, and I look at, has so much good in it. And I think that as we focus on the connection that we have, and we all realize without shame, without a doubt, we are loved and we are worthy. So that's my message. And um, I love you all. And again, to the church, no hard feelings. In case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. We'll see you guys.